Hello, everybody, and I'd like to welcome you to today's executive uh, meeting. Um, there are no um, apologies um, to record, albeit I'm now looking and Councillor Kilbane is here. So presumably we have had apologies from Councillor Douglas. I've just not been told. Yeah, yeah. So apologies from Councillor Douglas. Welcome, Councillor Kilbane. Everybody um, else that we think is, is here is here. So welcome to all of you. And obviously to everybody joining us in today's meeting and those watching uh, along at home. The first item is declarations of interest. So I'll give a couple of seconds for colleagues. Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's uh, already on my register of interest, but just to confirm, I'm an employee of St Peter's, so I'll be stepping out for that item. Thank you very much. Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is on my declaration of interest. I am a governor at Westfield Primary School, which is one of the big uh, items mentioned in the local plan thing. Thank you very much. Oh, and, and York High School, which is also. Don't forget York High School. That was the, um, thank you very much. Can't see any further indications. So we'll move straight on to agenda item two. Um, they're the minutes of our previous meeting. These are set out between pages one and 11. So again, I'll give a couple of seconds for colleagues in case there are any issues to raise. If not, if I could please see through a show of hands or nod if you're happy to accept those minutes. Thank you very much. So it's a clear consensus in favour of accepting those minutes uh, from the last meeting. And um, that then takes us on to item three, public participation. Um, and we have six registered uh, public participants uh, with us today who are all very welcome. And um, everybody who's joined us in person, and we don't have anybody uh, talking to us uh, virtually uh, today. Um, and I'm sure all the participants will know that they've got up to three minutes um, to talk to us once they've uh, come to the table. Our first public participant is Abby North. And this is regards agenda item five, the City of York local plan and the failure of the local plan to provide for the gypsy and traveller community, including boat uh, dwellers. And as mentioned, you're very welcome. And you've got up to three minutes. We're on. Thanks, everybody, for making your uh, three minutes available. Uh, it's not a lot of time, <laughs> obviously. So I came here and I spoke at the meeting of the local plan working group on the 16th of January, and some of you will have received the letter that I wrote to Councillor uh, afterwards. Uh, what I will emphasise today is that I can't agree, I couldn't agree with you more, Neil, with what you said after I'd made my speech, which is that it is a moral abdication of responsibility uh, to fail to provide traveller sites as part of inclusive, mixed, truly multicultural communities of York in the future. Uh, so I've spoken to, sorry, so it's clear from the plans that we've got in front of us today, that is exactly what the planning department chooses to do. That is what the plans say to us. What we're doing, where we've got promised, brand new private family sites as part of multicultural communities. What we're actually getting is 13 new pictures at Oswaldwick, which is one of the most deprived sites we've seen in this country. Uh, that is an abdication of moral responsibility. There's no doubt about that. Now, since the meeting last week, I've been very busy. I've spoken to the developers. It's not their responsibility. They agree with me on that. <laughs> And they've confirmed for me they're not going to be putting any traveller pitches on their housing developments. Not only is there not, not enough space to do that there, they don't have the expertise. They don't have the expertise or the will to do it. And they can't see how it is enforceable that the council is going to make them do it on, uh, when they're trying to build houses. It's not going to happen. I've spoken to the housing team at the council, the people responsible for managing the site at Oswaldwick. And they would be very grateful indeed if we were able to tell them that we are not going to make this awful situation in Oswaldwick so much worse for them to manage by putting 13 new pitches there. And finally, I've, I've been to Oswaldwick yesterday and I've spoken to some of the people there. And in particular, I spoke to one little boy who's 12 years old, his name was Marcus. And what my, I asked him to show me around the site, show me how are things gonna look better here for you? Uh, we don't want any more pitches at Oswaldwick. What I'm telling you today, we're not building more pitches at Oswaldwick. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna let you do that. We're not going to be building pitches on strategic sites. The developers are not going to allow that. What we're going to need is a policy that works so that we can build traveller sites the way that they're intended to be provided. Now, the local paper has published today an article telling, saying about our concerns, in particular, uh, that, we don't, that we don't have a policy that's going to work. The council has said... I've got 30 seconds. The council has said we can't fit that into the exclusion policy. Policy D 
allows for a rural extension policy that is GB4, allowing for affordable housing development in the Greenbelt where appropriate circumstances can be proven. That can apply to traveller sites also. The only way you can justify policy H5B is by reference to section to paragraph 63 of MPPF, which talks about affordable housing. If we're going to say that's an enforceable part of our policy, which can only be made enforceable by reference to affordable housing, if traveller sites can be provided in that way as affordable housing, they can also be provided in the green belt under GB4. Please make that explicit in policy and we can get on and do our jobs and make sure that there is proper culturally appropriate provision for travellers in this city for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments and we'll take that into account when we get to um, agenda item five um, later in the meeting. Our second public speaker today is Ruth Buckley, who's also read to speak on agenda item five, City of York Local Plan. And this is regard the removal from Greenbelt of the St. Peter's uh, playing fields. Um, and again, you've got three minutes to talk to us. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, all, and thank you very much for your welcome. Um, so my name is Ruth, and I live back to sit down. Yeah, okay, sorry, okay, sorry. I, I was just seeing if just because of the hearing loop and yes, virtually. Yes, absolutely no problem. Thank you um, very much. So my name is Ruth, and I live on Westminster Road, and I'm particularly concerned about the proposal to remove some of the green belt that's around St. Peter's playing fields currently. So I've put some copies out. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy for everyone, so people don't mind sharing, but I'll also hold it up here. So this is the one that's in the policy as stands. Um, and this one, I've just put a, a line for where the flood bank is. And you can see the flood bank goes through there, the middle of the green belt. And um, so this is the current green belt. The proposal now that's been made just before Christmas is for um, the removal of some key areas of the St. Peter's playing fields. In particular, I've noted that the proposed development area um, that there's a planning application in currently for, the proposal is to remove that from Greenbelt. So all told, what that shows is that this yellow area would then be proposed to be educational land rather than Greenbelt. So my concern with this is, that it's really quite irrelevant for that to be removed from the green belt because it's all flood zone three. So that's the dark blue here. So flood zone three is land that's the highest risk from flooding. And this is readily available um, on the internet for anyone to check. And flood zone three is not somewhere that should be developed. In fact, it can't be developed because it's got a risk of being flooded. So that includes the land that the proposed development application is on, and it includes the land that is being proposed to remove from the green belt. And this is a massive concern. If you're in any doubt that, it, because the key thing is, you might be thinking, well, some of this is behind this black line that I've put for the um, the flood defence. That's irrelevant. The flood zone three looks at flooding risk, irrespective of the anthropogenic um, flood banks that people might have put in because they can and do fail. And this is the picture of what happens when they do fail. What I've pointed out here is the field that is being proposed to develop that the planning application for St. Peter's is in for now. This is it in 2015 with flood water on it. It's got flood water on it. Got 30 seconds. It's got flood water on it because Burdike pumping station that protects all hundreds of houses behind the flood bank from the flow down Burdike failed and water backed up. It couldn't possibly get into the ooze because the ooze was in full flood and it backed up into that field. So this is wholly inappropriate to be removing it from Greenbelt because it cannot be developed anyway because it's in flood zone three. And that was all I wanted to say. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for coming. And we'll take your comments into account when we get to the agenda item. Our third public speaker today is Peter Hansen, who's also registered to speak on agenda item uh, five and on the same topic of removal from Greenbelt of the St. Peter's uh, playing fields. And you have three minutes. Thank you. I have timed myself and I am ever so slightly over. So please bear with me. It won't be, won't be by much. On the 16th of November 2022, I imagine City of York Council was somewhat surprised to get a strangely worded note from the local plan inspector, which suggested revisiting certain Greenbelt boundaries. 
This was two weeks after receiving a planning application from St Peter's School. In my email to executive members yesterday, I outlined, outlined how the inspector's note suggests that he has been given a sneak preview of St Peter's future development plans. All references in his note appear to refer to a situation where St Peter's fields have been built on. This is not the case, but it's certainly a hot topic given St Peter's live planning application to develop an access road, car park and commercial sports facility on grass sports pitches currently designated as Greenbelt in the draft local plan. What does appear clear from the inspector's note is his suggestion to move the Greenbelt boundary is only relevant if the land in question has already been developed and therefore makes little or no contribution to openness. See picture one uh, from my pack for how St Peter's proposal would entirely cover the grass pitches shown in picture two. At St Peter's currently, this is very much not the case as you will see from pictures two and pictures seven and eight on the back cover, which show land to the east of the flood bunt at the Scarborough Bridge and Westminster Road ends of the school site. Apart from one tennis court area and two astro pitches, the rest are virgin fields. The only structures they contain are rugby posts. To be fair, the Burdike pumping station sits between them, but that's another issue that I don't have time to cover. So how is it that the report to the executive is recommending the boundary relaxation? The answer lies on page 284 of the report where the officer responsible writes this. Reflecting the inspector's judgment on the contribution of this land, including sports facilities to Greenbelt openness and the strength of the proposed boundary, a modification is now proposed. So in order to be fully truthful about the words of the inspector, the officer has had to add including sports facilities into their sentence. However, they then completely ignore the fact that St Peter's does not have such built sports facilities on the designated Greenbelt. As such, the officer's recommendation does not agree with what the inspector has actually written. I would kindly ask executive members to check their own understanding of what the inspector has actually said before they cast their vote this evening. Conclusion. The Greenbelt fields behind St Peter's have afforded open, unpolluted views of York since it was founded almost 2,000 years ago. This evening, councillors are being asked to make a green belt boundary amendment, which they know could lead to its eventual destruction. We all know that there are very powerful interests lobbying for development to be allowed on the green fields of St. Peter's School. Until the highly unusual and awkwardly worded last minute note from the local plan inspector, this land was safely and rightly protected by City of York Council's sound local plan for all the reasons outlined in the January 2021 iteration of this document. Tonight, I urge councillors to look at the photographs in front of them and ask themselves whether they want to be remembered as the principal 21st century councillors who stood up for the City of York, its heritage and its future by drawing a tight green belt boundary or be forever associated with the decision that sounded the death knell for this protected green wedge. Councillors, contrary to what your Thank internal you. report says... I've, I've given quite a bit of lenience, so if you could draw a sentence to close. Two, two paragraphs. The inspectors... No, no, no. Not, no, no I'm words. going to have to stop you. One, one sentence, you're 35 seconds over. OK. The inspector's words do not ask you to move the green belt boundary when St Peter's fields are in an undeveloped state. Reject the proposed boundary change and stick to the January 2021 local plan that you previously agreed was sound. Thank you very much. You. We'll take your comments into account when we consider agenda item uh, five. Our fourth public speaker today is Andrew Dickinson, who's also registered to speak on agenda item five, City of York local plan, regards St Peter's uh, playing fields. And you have three minutes to talk to us. Thank you. So here we are. You are to decide if it is the right thing to do to declassify green belt, green belt land surrounding St. Peter's School, land which is actually owned by the council, I hasten to add, not by the school. Uh, I'm sure it's absolutely purely coincidental that this land is also needed to construct the St. Peter's new uh, car and coach park that they've just submitted their planning application for. It strikes me as quite suspicious. <clears throat> it's also rather suspicious that the chair of the governors of St. Peter's School was a former leader and head of planning at this council too. It is also quite suspicious that the planning inspector decided to make a very specific point 
to stop and to look specifically at the fields around St. Peter's School before deciding that it would be a good idea to change the designation. And then went on to look at some other schools in the area and look at their fields in case it was a little bit too obvious. There was a certain irony that when I asked to speak to members of this committee, I am referred to non-existent rules as a reason to avoid having any discussions with members of the public around planning applications, because you want to cite your independence, your impartiality, and of course, any charge of any wrongdoing, even though you are in fact encouraged to speak to members of the public, but that's another matter. Reclassifying the green belts flies in the face of everything this government, previous governments, this council, the media, the AU, scientists, experts, everyone has been talking about, I think, for as long as I can be alive. Protecting our natural environment, ensuring biodiversity, improving air quality, better quality of life for residents, less dependency on cars, increased use of public transport, and of course, the buzzwords, the carbon footprint. Simply ask the same rules should apply to St. Peter's that apply to everybody else. So. Thank you very much for your comments, and we'll take them into account when we consider agenda item five uh, later in the meeting. Our fifth public speaker today is Andrew Mortimer, who is also registered to speak on agenda item five, City of York Local Plan. And this is regards to petition from the Badger Hill Residents Community Group on. HMOs, uh, and you have three minutes. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, thanks for the opportunity to address the uh, executive this evening. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, paragraphs 41 to 46 on HMOs, and in particular, the reference to the petition submitted by the Badger Hill Residents Community Group on behalf of the 360 odd local residents who signed the petition. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing that is because it's, it's not clear from the report tonight whether you are making a decision on our petition or whether it's just a, a reference to it in passing. So I want to make some clear uh, points to you so that uh, it doesn't get uh, kind of dealt with by accident tonight and no further considerations given. First thing I want to say is our petition asks the Council to consider implementing an Article 4 direction to remove permitted development rights from Class C4 HMOs in Badger Hill. We have asked for this as our area has reached the 20% ceiling for new HMOs, and we are seeing increased numbers of existing HMOs being enlarged used in claimed residential permitted development rights. With such development, there is more often than not a lack of parking for cars, bikes, storage of bins, and quality of local environment issues, along with those others that we've listed in our petition. These important issues are already recognized by the council as having an impact on our community, as they are included in the existing supplementary planning documents on HMOs. They are also issues that both the council and planning inspectors have used to determine application for large HMOs, which still need planning approval. If, for example, the planning system is able to sort out the parking requirements for an HMO with seven residents, we fail to understand why the planning system wouldn't be able to do it for an HMO with only six residents. Doesn't make a lot of sense to us. We think that the proposal to deal with the issues that we've raised through an updated SPD and the new HMO license system will not work. If the expansion of a C4 HMO doesn't need planning approval, as it is carried out under permitted development, how will you be able to manage it using an updated SPD? Quite simply, you won't, because there's no requirement for the property owners to even tell you that the development's taking place. The council will only be able to take action if the application is brought into the planning system. And we believe strongly that permitted development needs to be removed to make this happen. Use of the licensing system doesn't address our concerns either. There's no clear explanation in the report about how this would work. There is clearly no room for any input from local community. Whereas the planning system is seconds. open to comments, the licensing system is not. The Badger Hill community and our representatives won't have any opportunity to respond to these applications. Chair, in conclusion, we'd like to ask you the meeting tonight to just uh, consider this as the start of the process to look at our petition. It's important to us that the full democratic process is seen to take place. Could I ask that you direct officers to engage with representatives of the Badger Hill community to help us address the issues we have raised? The residents of Badger Hill deserve a fair and considered response to this simple and workable request. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll consider your comments when we get to agenda 5 uh, later in the meeting. 
And our sixth uh, public speaker today is Councillor Danny Myers, who has registered on agenda item five, um, City of York Local uh, Plan, as the local ward councillor. And you've got three minutes to talk to us. Thank you, Chair. So as a uh, ward councillor, I spoke last week to local plan committee on this point. I made points there about open space deficit and flood zone three development. This evening, I just want to make three quick points and to say that <clears throat> this amendment, PMM49, uh, the green belt around St. Peter's, should be I'm asking you as decision makers to take that out of the local plan at this stage uh, in this executive meeting. Indeed, I described it as rolling over at last week's meeting, the council rolling over, but I think it's worse than that. I believe it's an abandonment of the council's policies. Just six months ago at the local plan hearings, QC Elvin, arguing for the council, said that this was a very sensitive location and that drawing the boundaries as the school proposes would not be appropriate. I'd ask you to back up that uh, that argument that the QC Elvin was making for the council. <clears throat> Secondly, the inspector's letter to make this amendment seems to preempt the development of the green belt in this location suggesting that artificial pictures and floodlights and buildings scheduled for replacement would somehow mean that this patch of land has already been developed or because it's earmarked for development, it's of a lower quality of green belt. So therefore you should change the boundaries at this stage around it. I'd ask you to throw out that assessment because I don't believe it's robust. <clears throat> and I think that we can see that there's a live planning application currently for um, artificial pictures and floodlights that's drawn significant objections from Sports England and the Environment Agency. My final point to executive, and it's, it's a really important point, it's about the boundary edge. It's not correct. You're going out to consultation on a, a map that is incorrect. Page 249 of the documents compares the 2018 map to the proposed amendment. It contains a triangle of publicly open land, publicly owned, accessible land flanked on the north side by a footpath, which is adopted highway, and on the south side, which is a public right of way from Westminster Road all the way through to North Parade. Not only is the public footpath not protected in the new amendment, there's no borders around that as is shown in the 2018 map, but the triangle on the left-hand side, the western edge, is publicly open land owned by the public, not by St. Peter's, and it's now hatched out in yellow as educational land. They don't own it. It needs to change. And so I ask the executive to back your existing policy, protect the green belt and take out this PMM49 amendment. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And we'll take into account your comments when we consider agenda item at five, I'm afraid. After public participation, we, we close that, that section. Um, so I'd like to thank all six of our public participants at today's uh, meeting. Uh, and as I said, we'll consider those representations when we get to agenda item five shortly. Um, the next agenda item for this meeting is item four, the forward plan. This is set out on pages 13 to 18. Again, I'll give a couple of seconds in case any colleagues want to raise any questions. If not, if I can ask if you're happy uh, for us to accept the forward plan. And so it's clear consensus in favour of accepting the forward plan. Thank you very much. That then takes us straight on to agenda item five, City of York local plan, which starts on page 19 and runs through to page uh, 306. Um, and I'm going to ask Neil um, to start us off and welcome to Alison as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this uh, report in front of you, is, as everybody in the room is aware, is a culmination of many years of work. But most recently, since the submission in May 2018, we've uh, gone through a pandemic, but we've also gone through 11 weeks of public inquiry, uh, whereby the planning inspectors, and we were assigned two inspectors, which is uh, not, not normal, shall we say, so York was con con considered to be special enough to have two inspectors and 11 weeks of public inquiry, and again, 
uh, it, that is a an extraordinarily long period of public inquiry. So uh, there is nothing uh, else to say, but the York's local plan is a very special and very well examined uh, piece of work. Um, in respect of that examination, uh, the local plan working group considered the report in front of you tonight and in, uh, have made uh, no proposals to change the recommendations in the report. They did ask, however, that the uh, executive were briefed on those issues uh, that were have been again raised tonight in respect of the public speakers. So uh, myself and colleagues will address those issues, but I think uh, it's just worthwhile starting out then from the perspective of uh, the Gypsy and Traveller community uh, representations. Uh, we have uh, considered the representations made by Abby last week and again tonight in respect to the council's policy, in particular in respect of green belt policy uh, and the provision for Gypsy and Traveller sites within those green belt as an exception. That was the council's original position when presented in 2018. Uh, subsequently, our then QC, now KC, and the inspectors agreed and asked us to re-examine that policy because it was not compliant with national planning policy framework. So the policy in front of you and now incorporated into the plan is compliant in respect of the green belt exceptions. In respect of the provision of sites from by developers, uh, we've been engaged with strategic site developers over recent weeks, and I would uh, entirely uh, agree with Abby in respect of they're not happy, but they have all recognised that from a policy perspective, they have to comply to get their planning commissions. Uh, as I made the point at the local plan working group uh, last week, we've put the highest level of protection in respect to those policies uh, for members to consider when the applications come forward if they do not have those uh, provision for those uh, traveller sites within their red line boundary, then you will have strong grounds for refusal. In respect of the uh, site at uh, Osbaldwick, uh, I think uh, uh, it's fair to say, and I recognised last week at the local plan working group and the uh, housing team who worked for me, uh, recognised that the Osbaldwick site is in need of improvement. Uh, both in terms of managerial terms and the, and the conditions on the site themselves. We have significant uh, off-site provision uh, in terms of funding from some of our other sites within the city, York Central being a good example, that would go a long way to put a significant investment into that site. And far from those housing officers uh, not uh, welcoming the, the opportunity to build uh, more uh, traveller sites at Osbaldwick, it was those housing it was the housing management team that came forward and demonstrated that the sites could be accommodated on the land that we propose to allocate within the plan there is absolutely no doubt across the whole housing management team it is a challenging prospect to manage it but a bigger site with more resources on it will give us the best possible chance to manage the, that that site in respect of uh, moving on in respect of st peter's um, I think there is a, a number of issues just to, to fl flush out there, and I'll move on to uh, let, let Alison explain the green belt, uh, uh, sorry, the green space um, policy within the within the plan. Uh, but in respect of the the boundaries at the moment, the city council does not have a green belt boundary. This is a plan that, for the first time ever, establishes the green belt boundary. The boundary that you see changing from was a proposed boundary in 2018. What you have in front of it, what, what you have in front of it is a change, another proposal. It will not be the green belt boundary until full council adopt it as such. In respect of the proposed changes by the inspector, the suggestion in respect of this was a somehow behind closed doors affair, the inspector had drawn to their attention a number of green belt boundary issues throughout the inspection process and they determined that they wished to visit a number of sites across the city this was this was what but one of many sites that the inspectors visited to determine their own view in respect of where the boundary should be um, and in respect of councillor uh, Meyer's perspective in respect of Ke uh, Casey it's now Casey uh, Elvin's uh, representations at the uh, planning inquiry, the inspectors were there, they heard Casey Elvin's representations and they came to their view as planning inspectors and asked us to, to reconsider that boundary position. 
therefore, when I look at the the boundary that we're looking at, we we have in place, we've just got to consider that this isn't a matter of moving the greenbelt boundary and thereafter the space behind becomes developable land just to identify for you know general development for housing. And I'll pass to Alison just to talk through the the green belt, uh, sorry, the green space uh, policy. Um, yes, so uh, if you have a look um, at the policy map mods, um, policy map mod um, 2017 shows um, the change from the 2018 map to the, the currently proposed one. Um, so there's a change in the mapping. So the way the, way the different designations are highlighted, there's a change there. But what will happen once if it's approved, the Greenbelt boundary is moved to the Bund. The land which is inside the, the school playing fields, which are inside the Bund, will become washed over by the open space, which is that kind of green dotted and a yellow school education designation. So the um, open space designation refers back to policy GI5 of the local plan protection of open space and playing fields. Um, and that says development proposals will not be permitted, which would harm the character of or lead to the loss of open space of recreational importance. So while it's important not to conflate the setting of the green boundary with the consideration of a planning application, it doesn't mean that moving the green belt boundary leaves the site open to any kind of development. There are still quite significant constraints on that side, site, the open space, it's adjacent to a conservation area. We've already alluded it's in flood zone three. So it, it's not a site that is just left open. There are considerable constraints when you're looking at planning application. So you might say to yourself, well, if the protections are there, why move the, the green belt boundary? The purpose of the green belt is to green belt boundary is to define the, the boundary of York where it then moves into an open character and it provides a character and setting for the city. And when you look at the significant scale of the bund that runs along that boundary of the school land, the inspectors have clearly taken the view that that, that, that bund in itself provides a barrier to the visual openness of, the, of, the, of that part of the city. And therefore, the permanence of the green belt will be better served by having that green belt boundary on that point. And whilst I'm not a planner, uh, my colleagues here are. So, uh, Alison, just to confirm your view in terms of the inspector's um, perspective on on that that barrier. Um, yes, I mean I think it is a professional judgment. The the assessment of openness and the planning policy guidance makes that quite clear. It's a professional judgment. Um, and I wouldn't disagree in my professional opinion. I think that the, the Bund is a good site for the boundary. And I think that there is there are some significant forms of development within that Bund, within the playing fields, that leads to a reduction in openness around that area. So if I move on then in respect of the uh, Badger Hill petition, um, I, I apologise if, if it hasn't been clear enough within the Badger Hill petition that uh, the concept isn't that the, that is it, that the, uh, the, those paragraphs fully address the issue. If you think if you look at paragraph 30, 44, it actually alludes to the fact that, they, that the Article 4 may, in some circumstances, be appropriate. But what uh, it uh, clearly uh, confers is the fact that the uh, executive have already um, and did so last May uh, committed to revising our, uh, the HMO SPD. Um, so if uh, executive were minded to clearly you could make an additional recommendation tonight to effectively ensure that the next report on the HMO SPD to the executive addresses the, the issue of the appropriateness of an Article 4 direction in that regard. And in terms of then the public engagement, 
uh, then the supplementary planning documents themselves will be subject to, to public consultation. So if, as, the, as much as, uh, uh, into, again, in respect of the, the context of the reference to the Badger Hill, uh, Badger Hill petition, it was such that we may continue to keep informed the petitioners that it hadn't been just uh, put, slushed off to the side. It was going to be addressed, um, and uh, the intention in the report was to effectively reflect that it would be picked up as part of that SPD piece. Um, and then just uh, finally, then in respect of the uh, comments from uh, Councillor Myers, I entirely agree, and I think Alison's already articulated that uh, it is open space. Uh, it is a flood zone. Um, and we, in respect to the commentary about the public owned, owned land, we will look to amend the map, it do, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, effectively preclude the, or have a weight on where the Greenbelt boundary is, because as you as it was quite evident across the whole piece, the, the Greenbelt uh, boundary doesn't reflect public rights of way or land ownership. It reflects a sort of a, a physical uh, statement as to the, the nature and, and character of the, the situation where the boundary is being applied. Uh, if I might then just finally move on in terms of the recommendations. So we've got obviously a recommendation for uh, the adoption of the amendments proposed in the report. Uh, this just to, again, to, to avoid any confusion, this is effectively the first time the report uh, through the examination process has been back in front of members for consideration. So this is whilst I had uh, delegated authority through the planning inspection process to uh, engage with the inspector and make uh, proposals on amendments, this is effectively yourselves uh, proposing that this becomes the City of York Council proposed local plan that would go for its final consultation. Uh, I must note, uh, and it's maybe not necessarily entirely clear within the report, so just for clarity, that proceeding to consultation is subject to the inspector's approval. So they, it is required for them to, to, to give us consent to move on to the next phase, but they would do so on the basis of the outcome of tonight's decision, because that would be the, the plan that we propose to adopt as a city going forward for its final consultation. Uh, the inspectors would then uh, consider the outcomes of the consultation and again all the public participants this evening will have the opportunity to make those representations because the inspector will consider those consultations. Um, the delegation provides for myself and, and currently uh, council air to, to carry forward those subject to something totally left of field so uh, you will recollect when the MOD brought forward the military sites that was a significant change in the facts so we had to respond to that so Subject to nothing significant or material uh, like that coming forward, uh, Councillor Eyre and I would uh, consider the outcomes of the consultation and then should they not be material in planning terms, and that's not in terms of the volume of responses, but in planning terms, then we could proceed to present this, the consultation outcomes and this plan to the inspectors who would then consider the plan uh, write up their report, make any recommendations to ourselves as an authority, uh, if thereafter there was again no material changes, and I can uh, c confirm to members tonight we have not had any uh, suggestions that there are any significant concerns from the inspectors. Um, so at that point, if there's no significant uh, uh, proposals to change, then again, there is delegation here in the report that myself and the then leader would uh, effectively take the, the recommendation straight through to full council. So uh, who knows, with a fair wind, the inspector might turn around their the report relatively quickly and we could have a, a local plan by the summer. So that's the delegations in respect to that. There's just one or two other smaller items of, of process that have dealt within the report in respect to para five, the supplementary planning documents. We've had a, a long history through the local plan development of bringing forward quite an extensive list of supplementary planning documents. The report suggests uh, how we might uh, consolidate those and prioritize those. Clearly that, that list is always subject to members wishing to have further supplementary do planning documents as the local plan uh, effectively gets teeth and people start to get used to using it. 
um, and indeed it will be up to a new administration to prioritise the order with which they are delivered and the speed in terms of the allocation of budget and resources to uh, put forward. But uh, tonight's decision would effectively uh, make it clear which documents to the developer community we would propose to develop. Um, and then finally, uh, there is uh, a full council resolution in respect of the Article 4 direct direction for remove in uh, permitted development rights, allow change of use from office to resident, residential, uh, and we would propose uh, executive agree that we start to prepare that uh, document because, again, that would protect some of the policies within the local plan and stop the unnecessary change of that, that those uh, establishments. Um, and then finally, again, in respect to the HMOs and shirt home holiday lets, the proposals to effectively have those as ongoing activities that need to come back to executive. Thank, thank you very much. So I'll open it for uh, colleagues, questions uh, and comments. I know there are quite a few questions that I'll go to in a, in a second, but just to say uh, first, having debated the, the local plan for many years, not 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 quite as long as some, and I look, look towards Councillor Waller, uh, who, who no doubt could beat me in terms of the number of years. And um, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to welcome um, the report and the progress that has been made on the local plan to, to get us to this point. And I'm sure colleagues will agree that this is undoubtedly a significant and a historic move towards adopting the first plan that we have had in over 60 years. Um, and as mentioned in the report, this is one of the final stages towards adoption of that plan and if agreed consultation on those final modifications that would then take place over the next couple of months with a view, as Neil has said, to submitting the final local plan to the planning inspector. And um, we feel strongly that this is a sound plan and one which will ensure that our city is able to deliver the housing, jobs and growth um, that it needs, including 18,000 new homes, new transport infrastructure, new employment sites and schools, and the inclusion of new policies to help respond to the climate emergency. At the same time, the plan will also work to protect York's unique character and beauty, as it will for the first time create and protect a permanent uh, green belt for York. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank um, officers and the planning inspectors for their considerable work, as I said, over many years in helping us uh, reach this stage. Uh, and equally, I'd like to thank the many residents who have taken the time to engage in various stages of this process and share their views on the plan. And, and with that, very happy to open for questions and comments from colleagues. Councillor Wooderson. Thank you. I've got two questions. One that's a simple clarification and then a more general one. So the simple clarification, following on from Councillor Myers, could you give me the confidence that the map's correct? and that the footpath is protected through that particular area of St Peter's. Um, so the yellow outline that we have on the modification was the outline given us by the school. Um, in the light of Councillor Meyer's comments, I'll go back to the school. We can go back to the school and get them to clarify um, exactly and just check that they are completely clear where it is. And if we need to change small areas that's a really small change to just remove I know I understand which triangle of land he's referring to and if that's we can just take that out under the delegation uh, and just to pick up on uh, the footpath uh, is put right away is put yes. right away that goes over practice that doesn't depend on the land uh, designation and if it is if it is council owned land again it just makes it even more difficult as you can imagine for any uh, confirmation from the from yourselves as to development on that side. Okay, so that was the first one, just to make sure we do cover that one off because there's lots and lots of detail. And if it's a minor change, that would be brilliant. But the main question I've got is, could you just explain in layman's term, right, how we've set the green belt and what any modification of the proposed green belt would mean for the whole local plan just so that we can get it in of our heads please layman's term if i pick up the second question and then uh i'll allow Alison the time to deliberate the, the first so in terms of uh, the next steps as i alluded to the uh, planning inspectors consent is needed to progress to the next stage so in terms of uh, it the um the decision around the st peter's boundary Clearly, if we were 
to not go with the planning inspector's uh, suggestion and a professional view on that, at that site and indeed your own officer's view, we'd have to look at the reasons that members uh, actually articulated this evening as to the rationale for it being a different boundary. We would then have to consider that across other boundaries across the city because we've got to provide consistent application of policy. Uh, so therefore that would require us to look at those other sites around the city and develop a, a, a rationale consistent with your thinking as to why that, that approach would, was being taken. That would um, effectively prevent us going to consultation prior to PERDA, because we all know we've got the election in May. We're, we're looking at a six week public consultation starting early in February, so that it can conclude before PERDA starts, which would effectively mean that we're looking at a, 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 a piece of work to rationalize it, potentially some public consultation on that, possibly not depending on the scale of the changes thereafter, going back to coming back to an executive, possibly in June, July, then going to the inspector again and asking them as to, well, have they changed their view in light of our new rationale? And would they then, then allow us to proceed to consultation? So that's the sort of practical impacts on the uh, the process, as it were. And I'll allow Alison to just talk through the, the green belt. Um, so yes, defining the green belt boundaries. Um, so it is it's a matter of character and openness with the green belt. So it's not issues of flood risk or or ecology. It's about the openness of the of the green belt. And in the case of York, um, when we're looking at green belt purpose, um, it's been refined down to the impact on the character and setting of the historic city. So as part of the exercise of going through, looking at all the Greenbelt boundaries across the city, a methodology has been worked up and then applied through all the inner and outer Greenbelt boundaries, looking at them. Do they meet the methodology? Are they open? What sort of land uses do we have around such that things like sports facilities, is that appropriate or not appropriate in the Greenbelt? Um, there's quite clear guidance in the national planning policy as to where what we can look at in particular we're looking for strong and permanent boundaries as well as well as this openness issue and the impact on the setting of the historic city we also have to find a clear and permanent boundary um, so I think this is one of the issues that the inspectors have, have seen is this issue where we've taken a boundary that comes off the back of the buildings at St Peter's and they're asking is that is that a permanent boundary because buildings are, are liable to be demolished and changed. Um, so I think the consideration is that the bond itself is a is a very permanent and legible boundary. So and it's probably just again so that there's just reassurances there that they've also reflected on the fact that the space that effectively would come out of Greenbelt would continue to be covered by our policies on a green open space. Thank you very much, Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question relates generally to the provision for recreation space, playing field space for young children across the city. There's a number of schools um, where there are differences um, from the 2018 um, plan. And therefore, I would like to understand how that provision of recreation and space will be defended uh, going forward, because what I would like to see is that um, schools lose out on um, playing fields because of uh, the way that this goes through, if it does indeed. Um, I think much like I covered earlier with the open space, so the policy GI5 covers open space and playing fields. Um, so if we were looking to um, develop on a school playing field, they have that policy cover that um, they would need to, um, so it's not permitted or they need to find suitable mitigation. Um, if it's actually playing fields themselves that are looking at redevelopment, um, if an application came in 
and um, was objected to by Sport England and the council were looking to approve that that needs to be referred to the Secretary of State for determination. Anyway, so there are layers of cover when we're looking at redeveloping these kind of previously undeveloped sort of sites. And just in terms of the amendments that are in the plan, they generally reflect the physical changes on the ground. So where effectively development has occurred uh, since the plan, since this plan was submitted, then the, the plan is uh, just reflecting those changes. I think it is also worth reflecting it, and as Councillor uh, Aspen has, has said, that you know this is the first time the green boundary is going to be defined. Likewise, the first permanent allocation of policy across the city is also going to apply. So it's going to provide us a, a much greater certainty for members and developers in the future what the policy is and. And you'll have to debate why you're deviating away from it when it comes to planning committee. Uh, thank you for that uh, answer. Um, I'm keenly aware that when I was first elected in '94, I was told to go on the Greenbelt Working Group. It's only six months off um, reaching fruition, uh, and then the local plan will be adopted. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, time passed since then, uh, but I appreciate the importance of ensuring that we we don't lose sight of the importance of open space, particularly within the urban core, where it is particularly valuable. Um, and I'll uh, take this opportunity, seeing as Westfield Fen is on the papers, uh, to, to ask that um, there's engagement with the community and um, uh, the mitigations are engaged with the community from today's activities, cheers. Officers are already seeking to address your concerns, Councillor Wallace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor de Gaulle. And, and just to say, it might just be me, but could you speak yeah. up a little, yeah. a, li a, a little bit? Thank you very much, Councillor de Gaulle. Thank you. It, it's sort of following on from this uh, theme about the exclusion from the Greenbelt, but specifically relating to the proposal on info barracks, which is ST36, um, page 228. Um, and I was listening with interest to your note about policy GI5. Um, could, I, could you clarify, is that specifically related to education establishments? Because um, the principle, the reason that this um, plot of land as sp uh, army sports field is proposed to be taken out of Greenbelt is by analogy to uh, the sports pitches, the educational sports pitches. But uh, the proposed modification as it stands at the moment shows white land, which doesn't suggest to me that there is any um, protection for it as open space if it is removed from Greenbelt. And it, if that is the case, then what I'm aware that there's a number of um, references and modification uh, 3.74 and 7.5 to a master plan for site uh, ST36. I suppose the question is then, can that uh, master plan be extended to include this uh, new area, which was previously down to be excluded as Greenbelt? Um, to ensure that there isn't any encroachment or onto the openness of the uh, Warmgate Stray, which is the, the reason it was proposed to be included from the, in the first place. Um, so just in respect of the uh, proposed amendments, the Greenbelt boundary, uh, very similar to St Peter's in terms of the looking from the Stray towards the back of the informed barracks, you've got a really clear, um, distinct tree line that runs along the, the back of the, the uh, facilities on the informed barracks. Um, in terms of the uh, space itself, it's not publicly open accessible space, it's, it's military space, it's, it's for the use of uh, exclusive use of, of the military. Um, I think in respect of the, um, the incorporation of uh, the green space, as it were, within the broader master plan. I think there's got to, and uh, Alison, if you can find the references, the specific references within the infall barracks uh, policies effectively require it to look at green space within the, the whole development. And also there's broader policies in the, in the um, 
within the plan that where you're abutting open space such as as the strait you have to effectively take into account the character and setting of the development as it blends into the into the stray itself so there will have to be consideration of that so i'd entirely expect in terms of a um a master plan and reserve matters application coming forward subsequently for the infill barracks it will be incredibly difficult for the developer to demonstrate uh, that they've complied with the authorities' policies without incorporating that area if they intend to develop it. it, it yeah, it would have to be coherent. And if you have anything to add to that. So the change here to the green belt came about again, inspector's November letter, um, and we reviewed it with the same, um, using the same judgment as the inspectors had used in St. Peter's. Um, and it was noted again that the site boundary provided a much more permanent and legible boundary than the building line that we currently had for the green belt boundary. Um, so it hasn't changed, however, the site allocation um, because that would be a, a far greater work in that we would need then to go back and look at the evidence base. Um, and it is, it's white land. So it wasn't a piece of land that was covered by open space designation. And again, if we wanted to cover it by an open space designation, we would need to go back and revisit the evidence base and do that work again. Um, so yes, I mean, the expectation is it would come forward with ST36 and issues like you said, the as how it buffers to the stray would be matters of good planning and controlled by other policies within the plan. So just to, if I, to, to come. Sorry, could, may I just add to that? That's a bit wrong. Um, just to confirm that uh, policy amendment MM 3.74 and 3.75, um, both deal with um, the master planning of that site and refer to you know open areas. Um, and as Alison said, um, consider the um, stray as well in terms of the policy requirements under the strategic policy um, of SS20. So we've made some amendments there, which are uh, linked to that map proposal as well. So just to clarify, given the fact that this, when the plan was drafted, ST36 didn't include this, but clearly any development on it would, uh, would be relevant for the MM, was it 3.75 that you just referred to would be relevant to this site as well as the ST36? Could we actually sort of phrase this in, in such a way to make it clear that the impact, the hydrological impact in particular of any development on that, that uh, area sports field would, would have an, a direct impact on the, um, on the stray um, and therefore should be looked at as a whole as part of any uh, proposals for SD36. It, that, that would be picked up by the policies council to go. Okay. So, okay. so, so we can have some assurance that, yeah, that that will be covered that, as part of the, this mod so, made a modification so that we will covered, it would be covered by that. the general policies because indeed, indeed the hydrological impact of any development in terms of this suds, for example, it has to be taken into account in your consideration of the application. I think this is a distinct and you're, you're right to raise the differences between this particular site and the St. Peter site and the fact that this site isn't designated as open space and therefore it will be is it highly likely to be subject to development I think when you've got the reassurances because you've got uh, abutted by the policy in respect to the broader site then it will have to be taken into consideration as to all those policies that do apply already to development so it should be already very well covered um, and it should be it's also worth relaying to uh, the executive just for those that haven't followed the minutiae of the local plan process uh, your housing uh, projections require uh, are predicated on 1800 or thereabouts the precise number eludes me around about 1800 windfall sites across the city so there will be many sites across the city that aren't specifically subject to specific policies like strategic sites that you will be applying all the policies of the plan to and this is an example where you've got an existing strategic site there will there will be effectively potentially a windfall on that site that will contribute towards that 1800 but it'll be subject to the broader policies and the 
perspective here is that because you've got it adjacent to a specific policy framework, then it would have to effectively blend in and, and, and comply with that. Thank you very much, Councillor Kilbane. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and throughout this whole uh, process, uh, Labour has risen above the political mudslinging because it's imperative that this plan doesn't fail. Uh, to, to the contrary, the plan must be rectified and adopted uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, throughout the process, York Labour has assisted the inquiry to reach a point where a far better and sounder plan can be adopted. Uh, we were certainly uh, more present at the inquiry than um, other political representatives. Uh, we need to get building and get and get the desperately needed affordable homes delivered as soon as possible. Uh, York Labour have methodo 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 methodologically addressed the weaknesses in the previous plans and argued for improvements, uh, many of which you see before you today, including uh, policy H7, the inclusion of affordable housing requirements on purpose-built student accommodation, uh, more on-campus student accommodation, reducing the pressure on York family housing, uh, policy SS1, increasing the delivery and quantity of affordable housing from 35% to 45% uh, to benefit York residents who currently struggle to afford to live in the city. Uh, and through Labour Council motions, we've ensured that the issues of office to residential conversions and high concentrations of short-term let accommodation are being addressed through Article 4 directions uh, and supplementary planning documents. Uh, on this last point, the loss of both family homes and office space represents serious threats to the city's economy and its residents, uh, one risking the flight of better paid jobs and the other risking making an increasing number of York residents homeless. Uh, so we can't afford to hang around on either. Uh, and so hopefully the urgency that we heard today uh, will be followed through. Um, uh, clearly, uh, with the plan now going to be delayed until after the election, uh, it will allow the Liberal Democrat councillors to continue to play pretend politics and carry on protesting against developments uh, that actually the Liberal Democrat Party is going to give uh, the green light to today. I do have one outstanding question. Uh, on Thursday, the 19th of March 2020, the executive agreed to produce a supplementary planning document outlining the requirements of the cultural well-being plan uh, in relation to policy D3 cultural provision. This was reiterated again uh, with calls for the same at the local plan working group uh, last week. Um, but this executive decision has been ignored in this report, and I wonder why. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, thank you, Chair. So just to uh, address that final point, uh, the proposal is that the uh, cultural matters are addressed in a cross-cutting thematic way, the similar way that is being proposed for equalities climate change. It's important that when a developer is bringing forward uh, proposals that sit in the context of the policy, it's worth reflecting that uh, that called plan policy is what applied. A supplementary planning document, as we discussed back in May executive, cannot add or change policy. So it's just merely a, a, an exemplification and clarification of policy. So the, the concept of having uh, culture along with equalities and climate change, et cetera, as thematic is that when the SPDs that are proposed are brought forward, the developer can, can see how they need to address, for example, climate change within the context of affordable housing, how they can address the issue of equalities in respect of other supplementary planning documents. So it's not that the, the, there is any suggestion that that, that uh, supplementary planning document issue is not addressed, but it is addressed in such a way that it is put in the context of, of a broader suite of policies. It's a matter for executive to determine, as I said earlier, as to which supplementary planning documents you bring forward. And clearly that could be subject to change over time. The proposal tonight is effectively to address the fact that there is a long list of executive decisions about supplementary planning documents and proposing a rationalisation and consolidation of that long list of decisions. But just to so I've got that absolutely clear, and uh, maybe this is a question for, for you, Chair. Um, if we go with what we've got here tonight in terms of supplementary planning documents or, or SPDs, um, that is that you'll be making an executive decision that overturns the executive decision that you made in March 2020 uh, to have an SPD uh, outlining the requirements of the cultural wellbeing plan in relation to policy D3. 
because I'm assuming it can only be an executive decision that can overturn an executive decision that you made um, just over two years ago. No, no. Uh, just in terms of content, supplementary planning documents that are proposed when brought forward will be subject to public consultation. Um, and the, uh, the fact that they will need to address, as per this decision, the issues address that of social and culture, it will be a matter of further executive decisions. But I think uh, Councillor Kilbane is absolutely right, just to be clear, you would be changing the decision that was made previously to have a separate SPD, but you wouldn't be changing the decision in terms of the, the issue is addressed through SPDs. Thank you very much. Um, so um, look for any more questions and then I'll go to Councillor Eyre at the end. So Councillor Smalling. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've just got three um, three questions, really, um, looking at the paper and hearing what we've discussed. I think starting with um, the St Peter's uh, representations, I, think I don't I don't sit on planning. Um, so, yeah, it's, it won't be my decision, but I think the public speakers today have made a really compelling and strong case. Um, and I think particularly aside from um, the discussion here tonight, I think I hope that that future decisions, I guess, of this authority bear in mind those those representations, particularly from a sort of flooding point of view, I think is the plainest example of how sort of, I guess, incorrect development, development of that site in the way that's currently proposed would be. Um, I think we've we've danced around it a little bit, and I think potentially my questions might have already been answered in a large part, but given the comments of public participants, could officers, I guess, explain how the recommended modifications were examined by the inspector um, and what evidence in particular the recommendations uh, were made on? So um, for those uh, who attended the public inquiry, the uh, process of public inquiries is iterative between the inspectors, uh, the authority presenting the position as, as adopted by uh, members and hence the, the, the nature of the delegation that you gave me uh, back in 2018 to effectively engage with and uh, address concerns raised by the planning inspectors through the process. So every single one of the uh, or, yeah, every single one of the uh, amendments in front of you has actually been seen by the inspectors, and the vast majority of those changes were actually considered during the um, inspection process, published as they were addressed by the authority to the inspectors, and the inspectors have, uh, as I said uh, earlier, not provided any material comment as to any concerns with the uh, proposals that were put through forward through the inspection process so they are familiar with everything that is in in front of you and the only uh, exception to that would be the the matters that were raised by them in their, their letter uh, that we've alluded to already this evening okay um thank you neil um the second point is on the um the second to last speaker um regarding the badger hill petition um I just want to sort of really clarify, she's because I think the public speaker mentioned at the end that I guess part of their part of their concerns was that this wouldn't be um, sufficiently addressed within an SPD. So I think it's obviously helpful to know that you it will be addressed within that discussion. But I think really, and I might be looking to the monitoring officer for advice, but just to to really clarify exactly how the concerns that were brought within that petition will be addressed by by the council because whilst I agree it should be definitely part of that SPD discussion perhaps I think there might be a role for other for other committees and for other parts of the council to discuss it given that part of the concern within the petition is that an SPD won't be sufficient. So um, I absolutely agree uh, Councillor Smalley in, in respect of the, the process what we're indicating within the report is that the uh, HMO SPD as it's developed will seek to address the issues. We believe that the SPD will address many of the issues and concerns raised by the Badger Hill uh, petition, but to the extent it doesn't, and certainly the SPD will subject to public consultation and further executive decisions, then uh, the officers and members will have the opportunity to consider 
other tools in the planning box, as it were, in terms of the Article 4, as to whether that's appropriate. Is there a, a sufficient enough evidence base and gap to effectively move to an Article 4? So this isn't a suggestion that there is, it's off the table. It's just effectively suggesting that there's the first part of call is the supplementary planning document. Then there's the opportunity to review and consider whether or not the Article 4 is necessary thereafter. So I think the, the question you were proposed to, proposed to the monitoring officer would be one at that time uh, as to have we addressed all the issues? Are there any more tools in the box? The proposal at the moment is we go down the supplementary planning route. Um, and as per the report that went to executive last June in respect of the HMO licensing proposals uh, that are due to be implemented this April, we expect there'll be a, an awful lot more evidence base and a lot more information uh, within the coming months to be brought to bear on the HMO supplementary planning document, particularly around the, the area of Badger Hill and those awards that are associated, uh, butt up against the university and they're subject to the greatest pressure of HMOs. That evidence base will go significantly towards informing both the need for uh, Article 4, if that is indeed determined, and or the nature uh, of the, the clarifications needed in the SPD. So I guess this is part 2B. Um, I mean, that I, I follow the logic and that makes sense, uh, Neil, but I think that there probably needs to be clarity now. And I, yeah, I, take, I take the logic in terms of it will be discussed and hopefully, like, as you say, fingers crossed, all of the concerns can be raised and, and, and dealt with within this SPD. But given that the petitioners, and I think this would matter regardless of the type of petition, whether it was transport or anything, I think within the petition, if you're flagging that you don't think um, the way in which the council are going to try and resolve these problems will be sufficient from the from the onset, it's probably for the council and perhaps the monitoring officer to, to outline where that then goes, because I think the those that have, I guess, taken their time to sign this petition need to know that it won't be sort of forgotten um, and dropped, for want of a better word. So if I, I know that if I'm petitioning on a transport issue, it'll end up at Andy's decision session, and that's very clear. I guess my concern here is that there isn't that clarity in where this petition will end up. Uh, I would refer to, I think it's paragraph 44, the clarity from the officer's perspective is that they don't feel that an article Paul will address it. But what I'm doing is in respect to suggesting that we will put, bring forward uh, the SPD is that we're not saying that that is a final perspective, but at the moment that is the view. But we need to, as the petitioners have suggested and you are indicating, we need to do further work on that to actually ultimately come down to on, on the facts that that is the case. Uh, but that is is not going to happen uh, within uh, within a reasonable time frame. It's going to be the, the the evidence base comes forward from the work on uh, licensing the HMO SPD because that will start to form part of the evidence base as to why an Article Four, if if ultimately that is the issue, uh, is is appropriate. So it's part of the process. Conscious, I've got Councillor Craghill waiting as well. Yeah. So, Small. so part two C, and then I'll get to my my third point. Um, will you commit then, Neil, to to I guess, and I guess you know entirely, I follow your logic with this, and I hope everything you've said turns out, to, you know, turns out to be the case. I guess, will you commit to, yeah, you know, the lead petitioner and those that submitted the petition to to keep them up to date with what with the progress, so that they know it's not it's not being dropped. Uh, absolutely, and I did recommend at the start that executive might want to consider a specific instruction to cover off that the uh, the next report to executive addresses the Article Four issue. Brilliant, Thank fantastic. Um, part three. If that's... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. it's when Councillor Air is telling me to move to, to move on. I'm taking note. Sorry, Councillor Small. No, I guess part part three um, on um, the supplementary planning do document. Um, I was at the local plan working group. Um, I think, yeah, myself and, and other councillors at that meeting um, discussed the cultural wellbeing supplementary planning document and how, um, and how I get, yeah, the decision, and I guess the, the quite sort of the fine balance between whether um, something is worthy of, a, I guess, of its own SPD or whether it's, I guess, more efficient, but also perhaps more effective to wrap it within every single SPD um like like we're suggesting here tonight on equalities climate change and cultural well-being um yeah i mean i'll be really honest I'm, I'm i'm my own views i'm not entirely settled on on either end of the on the spectrum of that decision i think it is a clearly a balance um i think 
I think regardless, almost, it's positive what you said, Neil, in terms of the council can always take a decision um, to create an SPD, you know, should anything, should any sort of matter arise. So I think that's, it's good to know that that door hasn't been entirely bolted. Um, but I guess here tonight, given that we had several public speakers at the local plan working group, um, plus it's an important, yeah, for a city, for a city like York, for all our residents, it's an important part of the planning policy. Um, just that that work is undertaken alongside the York Culture Forum um, and all other um, interested parties, that that work to develop what is within all SPDs and that cross-running theme of cultural wellbeing. Um, you know, we don't wait to start that work because that does need to, to start you know, imminently. And I know that, that, that <laughs> many organisations are already you know, onto it, for want of a better expression. But yeah, just a commitment really that we don't wait um, to start that work. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and again, I entirely expect to be held to task by the public and yourselves in respect of making sure that the uh, reflection of culture within the SPDs that are proposed is suitable and appropriate as to, uh, and meets the expectations of members of the public. Thank you very much. Councillor Craghill. Uh, thank you. Yes, I've just got, um, just got one question and uh, a comment on a different issue. Um, I just wanted to, um, just responding to the speaker from the York Travellers Trust, really, um, about the allocation of sites on, on the strategic sites. Um, and you said, Neil, um, I think you said, failure to provide inside the red line of the site will be grounds for refusal. And I just wondered if you could just clarify the robustness of that, because I think the policy does make some reference to... Um, um, developers being asked to alternatively, if they think they can't do that within the red line, to identify and deliver a site somewhere else. And then the policy does also refer to commuted sums. So could you just clarify, you know, what you were saying about yeah. why you, that policy is going to robustly deliver yeah. those new so, sites? Um, so the policy applies to the strategic sites. The strategic sites uh, are predominantly um, having York Central having permission already. Um, the predominantly green belt sites. There are sites that there, there is currently no infrastructure. Uh, so in terms of the um, officer's perspective and certainly uh, having the early engagement with those developers, uh, they will really, really struggle to come up with a rationale as to why they cannot provide a site for Gypsy and Traveller um, uh, pitches. Uh, with it because effectively it's a blank blank canvas and you can design the community and as I said a local plan working group and, and thank you to Abby for re recognizing m my expectations and hopes for this uh, policy is that that will in ensure that we do have integrated communities that are uh, uh, effectively varied and, uh, and have different perspectives and I think that's a really important uh, point of, of plan making is that we uh, aim to that achievement there are errors, however, because in, in terms of absolutes, the planning policy planning is always a, a question of it avoids absolutes. There is opportunity for those developers to come together or uh, individually look at specific offsite provision. But it has to be specific offsite provision that was in within the areas within the authority that are develop are identified for development. So effectively, white land. So if there there could be alternatives that members through the planning process feel are suitable or better suited than the site itself. Uh, however, when you start to get to this extent of offsite provision, um, the inspectors themselves, in respect of our own requirement for provision of sites required us to specifically identify that there was capacity at Osbaldwick and Clifton to provide the sites that we need. Their view was that without that identifying specific pitches, our plan would actually be re risk being unsound. And I think therefore taking that, that rationale and that logic through to the strategic sites I feel that the, this policy and the, our legal advisors and our, our, our planning officers advise that actually to, to have an off-site provision in cash terms with no, no site identified would be solid grounds for saying that the application was not acceptable, didn't comply with policies, because an off-site provision without any site identified is, uh, is effectively, well, where is that going to be? effectively in application of responsibilities but clearly what we can't do is predetermine 
these are matters. There will be a matter for the, the decisions and the uh, of the committee at the time. But we are advised that that is the uh, the strongest way we can articulate these policies. And the planning inspector has effectively confirmed confirmed, but has given us uh, given us no indication that the policies as proposed uh, are not suitable and do not comply with our requirements. Um, and the developers are reluctantly. Uh, uh, recognising that it is something that they're going to have to address. Hey, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Once, once we're in this stage, we can't do public participation. You'll have, you'll have to do that after or outside of the meeting. Apologies for that. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'm, Councillor Craig. Yes, I, I, I just got to come up, which is not not about this. So I, I wasn't planning to comment further. I just wanted that clarification. Uh, just just on a slightly different topic, um, which has already been touched on, but I just wanted to welcome the inclusion in this paper of the reference to um, holiday lets, which I know is an issue that concerns a lot of communities, particularly well all over the city, but particularly in the central wards. Um, and I just welcome the commitment to building up the evidence base um, on, on this issue. It's very important for local communities that there is, there is an impact from holiday lets and there is also some growing indication that it has an impact on affordable housing supply. So I'm really glad that we're doing that work to build up the evidence base, both in response to government policy that may hopefully be coming forward, changing the planning use classes on that issue, um, and also on any further local um, policy that we might develop uh, in future, we need that evidence base. So I just wanted to welcome that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll go to Councillor Eyre now, and I wonder, Councillor Eyre, in, in amongst whatever you're going to say, whether you could pick up that suggestion from Councillors Murray and Neil as to whether there needs to be a tweak of a recommendation on HMOs or not. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was interesting to hear Councillor Kilbane taking credit for the local plan. I think next time we'll hear we'll be maybe taking credit for new libraries in Clifton and areas like that. It's, it's amazing what, what they've achieved in the last few years. Not I think I don't go back as far as Councillor Waller does in terms of this, but I thought I thought it was my first meeting was about the local development framework. It wasn't actually. My first meeting was a full council meeting about with a motion to ban foie gras, which I think was a, a motion that crashed the council's IT system. I led to about 500 protesters at that one, but it was the third meeting I attended which was the local development working group, of which three of those members are still here today. Councillor Waller was at that meeting and, and Councillor de Gorm was there at the time. We were 13th of November 2007 when we were back discussing the strategic housing land availability assessment at the point where we were trying to identify housing land for the city for the next 10 and then ahead of that to 15 years. And I do believe it may actually, Councillor Waller, have been the same individual who persuaded me to join the local development working group who persuaded you to join the Greenbelt Working Group. And I think he suggested a similar sort of time frame as well in terms of how long I would have to spend on that one. It has been a, a particularly long journey around that point. We did get within four years of that to submitting a plan to government at that point, at the end of, uh, it was around about May 2011. That was withdrawn after the election in May 2011 and amended. That was then three months after that was submitted to government, that was amended again. And a further plan was put forward, achieving something around about the home. 1,200 homes per year was muted, a plan that, that never got off the ground in terms of that one. So it was around about 2018 that we got to this particular point of, of restarting from that and building a plan that we know is robust, that has housing numbers that are deliverable and are what are required for the city and delivers the green belt that we need. And I think it's interesting in many ways about what we're not talking about today as much as what we are talking about, as Councillor de Gaulle will know the length of time he spent on that, that we're not having a conversation about yeah. housing numbers, population growth, what those particular figures are. We're not having massive conversations about strategic sites, where those houses are, what will be delivered on those sites, the education, the infrastructure, et cetera. We're not talking about the vast majority of the Greenbelt. We're talking about particularly small areas around about three to four different fields across one of the largest and most significant Greenbelt areas in the city. And we're not talking about employment land and where those jobs and where those growths will be that will deliver the economic strategy. That, I think, is testament to the amount of work that's gone on on behalf of members, officers and members of the public to get to a plan that it would appear, on evidence of what we're seeing, has somewhere probably around about 99.5% approval of the vast majority of people around there. I know developers would have liked things to have been different 
residents will have, will have liked certain things to be different, but it really is testament to the work that's gone in that we're at a point where most of those issues have been thoroughly investigated, bottomed out, and not available to be discussed here today. We are delivering a permanent green belt. So our green belt was established in the 1950s as a general concept around what that might be. I think it was the RSS in 2011 that set about trying a first stab at looking at how we might define those boundaries. But as we all know, anyone who's been on planning, those boundaries are particularly loose and iterative, and we've never had that, that clear definity. This does provide that. And again, while there will be some disagreements about where particular boundaries are drawn in particular areas, the vast majority is supported, and it gives that permanence and gives that confidence for the next 20 to 25 years that that green belt will be robust and will be defendable. We will be delivering 18,000 new homes that the city desperately needs. We will be delivering 4,000 affordable homes as a minimum from that part. And I think it's reflecting on the times that we're at this point that I was told numerous, numerous occasions that we would never make it through public inquiry. The planning inspector would rip the green belt proposals to shreds. The planning inspector would reject the housing numbers. Everything was con conducted in the wrong way and it was all politically motivated. It never was. It was evidence-based, a huge amount of work has gone in. I was going to commend the work of the local plan working group in terms of dealing with that, but given that all of the questions, with the exception of Councillor Kilbane, came from members of the local plan working group who had this paper last week, I think I may have to review the terms of reference as it's clearly not working as efficiently as it should be in terms of that one. And I think finally, on that issue of SPDs, I think that again is testament to how far we've come in a local plan that at this stage, when we're going out to consultation on what will be the definitive plan for the city for the next 20 to 25 years, we're actually already progressing and talking about how we can make it better. And I've always said that's what we should be doing. We should be getting that agreement, getting that local plan through and being at a point where we can have discussions about SPDs. What are the most appropriate SPDs to be starting and working on now? What are the ones we need to look at? And what are the ones we need to look at years one, two and three as we head towards that? Those initial review points that go through that, I think, with that chair and any potential amendments that people may suggest, happy to move the recommendations. I wanted a suggestion from you on the amendment. <laughs> so I'll give that to Neil. Okay, what so, was the particular suggestion for uh, so the, more clarification? So the, the suggestion was in respect of budget, the uh, petition in respect of the HMO SPD. So if we go for a, um, a separate recommendation, so in the development of the HMO SPD, the officers specifically address the issue of uh, the Badger Hill petition in respect of the use of an Article 4 direction for the control of the expansion of HMOs. Thank you very much. I'll just check with Bryn that that is all okay as an additional recommendation. So I'm getting a, a nod. Um, so obviously we've got the uh, proposed um, recommendations uh, in front of us um, on pages uh, 19 and 20 with that uh, additional recommendation um, that has been suggested. Can I please see if colleagues are happy to accept those uh, recommendations. So that's a clear majority in favour of accepting those recommendations. Thank you very much. And um, so that now takes us to um, agenda item six. But before we go on, I think I, should, I hope Councillor Smalley is telling Councillor Mason, or you will as well, yeah, yeah, that, that he can he can come back into the room. And um, so we'll just wait a couple of seconds uh, for Councillor Mason to return, and then we're moving on to agenda item six which is the introduction of community infrastructure uh, levy. Okay, so we will now move on to item six, uh, which is between pages 307 and 322, and I'll hand back to Neil to start this one. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, just to, to be clear, the uh, community infrastructure levy uh, policy is entirely separate from the local plan. But there is a, a link in terms of the uh, timing 
that we're proposing uh, for the authority in that as part of the local plan process, it's important to demonstrate to the public inquiry that the policies that the authority uh, wants to impose upon development are affordable. Therefore, there is a, a need to undertake a viability appraisal of all the policies within the local plan. Uh, that work was refreshed as part of this year's uh, public inquiry process uh, because clearly we were refreshing some of the policies uh, that had uh, changed. For example, the climate change policy had changed to reflect uh, updates in the legislative framework. So that work was undertaken and <clears throat> by specialist consultants and uh, therefore it's a very small leap thereafter having undertaken a viability appraisal uh, in respect of policies to see then what headroom does that viability appraisal provide uh, over and above uh, those policies in respect of the anticipated um, uh, value of sites going forward. Uh, and that includes the uh, ability for developers to make a reasonable profit on those sites. So the SIL is not intended effectively to, to, to stop profitable investment and development. Um, it is the case that we, the headroom then that you are uh, taking forward, which is a general um, viability appraisal on the whole policy based on uh, character types of, of housing, that, that you can then start to look at the different types of characters and that prov provides thereafter a viability schedule uh, as we've proposed within the appendices. Uh, it isn't set at the absolute maximum uh, the guidance is that it isn't set at the absolute maximum because what you're doing is looking at averages across the city so you've got to look at a, a rate that would reasonably be payable across the vast majority of sites the other reason being is what you don't want to do is effectively have a chilling effect on development by effectively discouraging the development in the in the city because actually the sill level is discouraging discouraging developers to invest here they choose to invest elsewhere within the region because effectively they'll be more profitable in their return. So that's the sort of principle behind it. And I'll refer back to Alison, uh, just to talk about maybe some of the specifics that we've taken forward within the SILV approach. Um, yes, uh, I, mean, I think I just wanted to touch on a few things, questions that kind of come up in relation to SIL. Um, so SIL, doesn't replace section 106 agreements, which do continue for things like affordable housing, which isn't funded by SIL, and for any um, directly related infrastructure. So if you have a one of the strategic sites has to provide, according to the policy, a primary school, that will still come under a section 106 agreement. So they will run together. Um, but SIL is non-negotiable, it's just a per metre squared charge. Um, so it has benefits there. It's inde index linked, um, so it'll change through time. So while we have the draft charging schedule, um, which was attached with the documents for today, um, the rate will change as index linked. Um, so and the benefits then of SIL, um, that it's greater flexibility. So where we spend section 106, payments is really quite tightly defined under the planning policy um, and they need to be directly related to development. Um, SIL, however, can be pooled. So SIL from different developments can be put together and put to larger infrastructure items. They don't need to be locationally related to the development which is paid the SIL. Um, it also collects from a wider range of developments. So a Currently, I guess that we would get Section 106 payments from generally larger sites. Well, that won't be the case. You can see from the draft charging schedule that we'll be getting um, SIL across a range of sites. Um, probably, I think, from um, it generally works out from one development of one dwelling upwards, uh, above one dwelling, sorry, in that SIL build housing is exempt from SIL. So generally a self-build house would be um, zero rated for SIL. Um, uh, um, so the other other benefits, um, I think I've said Section 106 payments would be negotiable. Um, SIL is, isn't is ne negotiable and it gives um, greater certainty to developers. Um, there's not the complex and long-winded 
um, working out of Section 106 agreements. So it is a, a more straightforward process and it's fairer in that it's directly related to the um, floor space of the development. Um, I think that was probably what I wanted yeah. to cover along yeah, with that. So I'll just uh, finish that off to say that unlike uh, the, the decision you've, you've just made, um, this uh, proposal will go to public consultation and then come back to executive uh, so that the executive can consider representations from the, the community at large, uh, in digital in particular, the developer community. Uh, you will then consider the, the schedule at that point in time. And then if, you, if the executive are content at that point in time, it will go on to a public inquiry um, they are told that they are normally only last a day. The only subject matter of discussion is the charging schedule um, and the uh, viability appraisal behind that, uh, which, as I said in my opening comments, is current. It is the time to do it. And I think that it gives us the best prospect of having a successful public inquiry uh, because there would have to there'd have to be demonstration that our uh, charging schedule effectively was not viable and we believe it is and certainly our advisors are suggesting that the proposals within the report also reflect the policy in being in terms of a reasonable adjustment to be payable across the across the piece thank you very much councillor mason uh, thank you chair uh so in the report the introduction of the community in infrastructure levy uh, would allow the council greater flexibility uncertainty than the current section 106 agreements to support the infrastructure that is to be funded to deliver the local plan. The SIL would also provide developers with greater certainty as it's a non-negotiable and therefore developers costs uh, are more readily calculated than previous 106 agreements uh, that were open to negotiation. I'd like to thank officers for all their uh, hard work that has gone into analysing the viability of the potential charges to get to the point where we have uh, an extensive proposal in front of us. Clearly the proposal will be subject to consultation and independent examination, only after which it will be able to adopt, it, uh, we will be able to adopt this new levy. Uh, with the local plan now entering its final stages, not, not be everything else we've been told about caviar and uh, other things that take six months, uh, crucial will be to get this right and the approach to delivering uh, the homes and business spaces uh, set out in the plan. The community infrastructure levy Excuse me. Mm. Lost where I do have... oh, sorry, I had to open the email and now it's gone uh, lost where I was. Anyway, I'll jump to the end. It's easiest. Uh, with that said, Chair, I'm happy to uh, support the recommendations in the report. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just pause in case there are any questions or comments from colleagues. Councillor Kilbane. Oh, thank, thanks, Chair. I've got a question for officers and then a couple of questions for Councillor, Councillor Mason. Um, question for officers is, is it possible within the scheduling um, to use uh, the sale in such a way that it encourages certain types of development over other types of development? So to try and encourage sort of family homes, I suppose, over, over hotels, that kind of thing. Um, and for Councillor Mason, uh, my understanding is you need an evidence base to support your still charging, but you don't actually need to have a local plan in place. And given that the regulations have been around since 2010, um, if that's the case, why, why is it taking so long to be introduced? Because clearly we might have missed out, uh, residents might have missed out on millions if that is the case. Uh, and secondly, given the difficulties that we have spending the Section 106 money, uh, why should residents be confident that the council will be able to uh, spend the SIL money? Um, well, I'm happy to start with the first bit of the question. So um, you can't use it to encourage or discourage types of development. It's based on viability. Um, so it's simply a, a viability assessment um, done on, on the development costs, the profit, and then that available every So you can't use it effectively to stop or encourage certain types of development. It's as simple as that. Um, was, was that as far as the next question for councillor? Uh, I'll definitely not venture into question two. In, this, in terms of question th three, I think they, in terms of the uh, section 106 piece that I think as Alison's described, 
Uh, Section 106 has to be ra raised on the specific impact of a development. So, uh, and what we've seen on uh, on occasion, not always, but on occasion, is small contributions uh, towards infrastructure. So, so if you can imagine, I think there was a junction where there was a £30,000 contribution towards the junction because that was what, the, it was only a relatively small development. The ambition was that actually there's an upgrade to a junction the contribution was 30,000 when the actual work was undertaken as to what the cost of that junction was it was in the hundreds of thousands and that they, therefore that then has to go to the executive member for consideration as to whether or not actually is that a priority for general taxation um, if that's not the case then it effectively the 30,000 pound is put, be paid back to the developer because actually uh, whilst there is a a, a contribution to in terms of the impact on that junction it's not so material as to require the whole junction to re, be remodeled as it were so that's the that's the downside of the the section 106 model and in in, in some occasions uh, has caused the, the the issues in respect to delivery but i would absolutely acknowledge in terms of delivery overall there is a you know it's an ongoing pressure for, for us as officers to address councillor mason Thank you. I suppose in terms of the, the 2010, uh, between 2010 and 2015, uh, I've got no idea what, what happened there. I only came on in 2015. But um, obviously, in terms of taking over this executive role, again, this was the first thing that was put onto my plate in terms of one of those issues we're moving forward. Uh, I can find out probably more, more context in detail around what happened between 2010 and 15, and then from 15 onwards for you. But um, yeah, can't comment in detail about why why neither council decided at that point it was the most appropriate decision to take to, to move this forward. But I think obviously sitting with the local plan, it makes sense that there is that evidence base and we kind of, you know, take two birds out with one stone in terms of using the, uh, you know, the same same work that's been done to, to get us to two ends. Um, second question was about monitoring, I think, was it and making sure we spend it? I suppose there'll be two aspects. Obviously, some of it is devolved. Uh, so, you know, parish councils and uh, Town councils will have some authority to spend some of that, and hopefully that will give them more local control and people have oversight of that. And I suppose a bit like what's already been said, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on it. Hopefully, it's not as um, not as painstaking as sometimes Section One Hundred Six can be in terms of uh, you know determining where it goes. So, I think we'll see, and I think it's a new thing. We'll be we'll be keen to see and keen to spend. Thank you very much. So we've got the recommendations. Uh, in front of us between pages um, 307 and 322. Can I please see if colleagues are happy to accept those recommendations? So that's clear consensus in favour of accepting those. Thank you very much. And um, that then moves us on to agenda item seven, recommissioning of domestic abuse services. And um, this starts on page 323 uh, and runs to page um, 344 in the uh, agenda. Pack, uh, and I think I'll be handing to Anita first to introduce this uh, to us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so the purpose of this uh, report is to seek authorisation to approach the market for recommissioning of domestic abuse services in, in York, although the procurement will be led by um, North Yorkshire Police Fire and Crime Commissioner, um, because it's a joint piece of work between um, that body, ourselves and North Yorkshire. Approvals being sought to enter into that joint commissioning agreement um, and we're looking to um, secure services for domestic abuse over an eight year period, which breaks down to a four plus two plus two contract with a total value of um, £2,095,994 over that lifetime of that eight year contract. Also, approvals being sought from this meeting that um, the delegation for decision making around that um, contract will sit with the director of public health and obviously in consultation with the um, executive member for um, adult social care and public health. Um, so the recommendations is that um, to authorise officers within City of York Council to work in partnership with our um, with the other two organisations. Um, City of York will have representation on tender panels, so we will have a voice in that joint commissioning, um, and also to authorise the Director of Public Health to award the contract following our procurement guidelines. And the reason for this is to enable uh, domestic abuse services to be available across York that provides value for money um, and, and addresses local need. 
the background to, to this um, paper is that um, you may be aware that the Domestic Abuse Act got Royal Assent in 2021 and places a statutory requirement on local authorities um, for the provision of a range of services to support victims of domestic abuse. It also conferred responsibility for governance around domestic abuse and to that end, in December 2021, we did set up um, a York Domestic Abuse Local Partnership Board with a, represent a wide representations of organisations that sit on that board. Sitting underneath that board, we have the um, Domestic Abuse Joint Commissioning Group. And through this commissioning, that's where the governance will sit. So we've got that joint commissioning group and the governance will be at the partnership board to oversee those services and make sure that, as, as we've said, the supply what we need to supply um, for the needs of our population. So um, the, when we talk about domestic abuse services, what, what we mean in that is community victim support. Um, you can see in the report the breakdown of the financials that, that go along that. But there's also domestic abuse perpetrator provision um, that, that um, addresses perpetrator um, behaviour, and that looks to break the cycle of repeat offending. And so that's seen as an important element of, of that service. There's also the um, refuge, refuge and accommodation side to that service as well. So there's three parts to that services. Um, and it and you can see the financials there. Um, we have uh, done consultation on this joint commissioning um, through the Domestic Abuse uh, Partnership Board, um, which includes um, the voice of the service users, the police, health through the Integrated Care Board, children's social care, adult social care, housing, um, and our voluntary sector. The timeline for the recommissioning is that um, we'll follow our procurement guidelines um, with the expectation that the new services will be in place from the 1st of April, and that aligns to when the existing services finish at the end of March that year as well. Um, so the options um, available to, to the um, to, to this uh, meeting is the approval of the recommissioning and the said delegated uh, responsibilities, or indeed not to, not to approve, and in which case we'll, we'll, not, we'll not get the services. So um, the recommendation is uh, option one, that we can go ahead with that joint commissioning to provide the services that are required for our um, citizens across York. Thank you very much. You're and welcome. Open it for any questions and comments from colleagues, Councillor Runtman. Thank you, Chair. Um, this may be the last report, and it may be a small one, but it's one which addresses a hidden problem in the city, which we need to take careful cognizance of and try and help and support those who suffer from domestic abuse. It's a significant public health issue and has a major impact on the health and well-being on those directly affected and their families. As we've heard, there's a holistic approach across the city to deliver crucial support services. Their aim is to focus on prevention, strengthening support for victims of abuse, and ensuring there is access to appropriate accommodation. Violence or abuse of any kind is completely unacceptable. And it's very worrying to know that domestic abuse incidents have risen since the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to remain high. As part of the provision of crucial literal services, as well as through our work on the White Ribbon campaign, we have been bringing together partners across the city to address this issue. The council, our key partners, the police, significant local organizations such as IDAS are working hard to end domestic abuse and to provide support. I'd like to thank them all as well as the York Domestic Abuse Local Partnership Board and the Domestic Abuse Joint Commissioning Group for everything that they do. It's important that we continue to take a proactive and joined up approach to tackle the concerning level of abuse and to make sure there is support for people when they need it most. The recommissioning process alongside North Yorkshire County Council and North Yorkshire Police Fire and Crime Commissioner could result, as we've heard, in over £2 million being invested by the Council in support services over an eight-year period. 
I'd like to express my thanks to officers for all the work that I know has gone into this report. And I'm happy to recommend to my colleagues that they support option one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Lunsman. So I'll just give a couple of seconds in case there are any further comments. Councillor Kilbane. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chair, and um, and thanks. Thanks for the report. Um, just a just a, a few questions around it. I'm very very pleased to see this coming forward because it's been quite heartbreaking to have uh, organisations that work with victims of uh, domestic abuse actually applying for ward funding to 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 try and run some of the some of the basic things that they need to do. So please see it coming through. I think my questions are around um, whether or not it's actually going to be enough. Uh, so are we going to be able to fund outreach work, uh, for example? Um, are we going to shorten the times that, that women wait for support uh, if they've applied for, uh, for if, if, if they've come forward for support? Because I know there's, there's, there can be quite a wait at the moment. Are we still going to be looking at um, quite a lot of unmet demand? Uh, so is this sort of based on uh, projected need? And is does this factor in? Uh, inflation. So is it, is it index linked? Because obviously, you know, quite rightly, it's over a longer longer period of time. Um, but we'd need to consider that. And and just a final point for consideration, really, um, uh, it, the decision on the tenders will be uh, delegated to to officers. But I think it would be a good idea if the before those decisions were made, the relevant executive members uh, were, were consulted because we'd certainly want to uh, be making sure that we were happy with the process. Yeah, thank, thank you for. I think I've, I think I've jotted all, all that down, but um, you might have to just just remind me on that. Um, the 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 funding that we've outlined in the report is what we what we expect to be able to cover the services that that are required. Um, we do have. We do have other pieces of funding that we can offset the work of some of the um, services that are going forward. So th this is the core funding. The other parts of the service, we, we've got funding, central funding coming straight for domestic abuse, which is attached to the Act, that we can support extra work going forward and which we are already doing. So I'm quite confident that, the, that any extra pieces of work we've got funding available to do, and it's something that we're looking to expand. So we've already done a lot of work. We are existing service providers to look at need, look at extra provision, and indeed we've already funded some of that. So I'm quite confident that, that we've got enough funding going forward and it will be enough for the projected lifespan of the, of the contract. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers a, a couple of points that, that you're in. The, the other thing around um, shortening support for, um, for victims, that's not something that we envisage because we've got, a, along with the Act came quite a, quite a bit of funding. Contrary to shortening, we're looking to expand that service and we've put extra money into IDAS already to be able to do that. We're already looking to, um, since domestic abuse came to sit in public health, we're looking at it through a public health prevention lens. We're looking to support, do holistic support, not only for the, for the, um, for the victim, but in the act children are classed as victims as well so we want to expand the support that we've got to look at holistic family support so i'd like to assure you that that work's already started and that we've got funding attached to be able to do that thank you thank you sharon yes just to um clarify um for for councillor kilbane uh, and other members um, we we have another source of grant funding which isn't covered by this report. So the funding that uh, this report deals with is um, core council funding. So it comes out of the um, council's baseline budget. Um, we also have um, an additional grant that comes down from the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, which for York is 334,000 uh, a year. Um, that money is specifically to, um, uh, to, to implement the safe accommodation requirements of the Domestic Abuse Act, as, as, as Anita has mentioned. Um, we were given that money, or local authorities, not just York, were given that money for 
this year, and we were told it was non-recurrent, um, but we were uh, informed this week that we'll continue to get that funding next year and the year after. So what that will enable us to do is look at how we can use that, that separate grant with the criteria we have to submit reports to, uh, to, 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 to uh, government on that. But because it's money that's sitting in, um, in, in, in the public health budget, it does give us some flexibility to be able to say, as Anisha said, what we want in York is a whole system approach. Um, where it's appropriate, we'll jointly commission with North Yorkshire, but when it isn't appropriate, we'll commission just, just, just on a York footprint. And it allows us to use those pots of money flexibly um, to be able to ensure that um, uh, the, the, the needs of residents in, in York both um, men and women um, and other, you know, this is not gender specific services. They're not just for, for, for women, they're for all residents, however they identify themselves in, 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 in terms of their gender. Um, so I, I hope that reassures members that um, uh, there, there is sufficient funding available for what we're wanting to do. Obviously, we'd always like more money, um, but in terms of what our strategy is at the moment and the needs based on the um, needs assessment that, that we've done, uh, we're confident that there is sufficient funding for the strategy we have in place at the moment. Thank you very much. So we've got the recommendations um, in front of us, and I see from the recommendations that that it is in consultation with the executive member, um, which is on pages 323 to 344. If I could please see if colleagues are happy to accept those recommendations. So that's a clear consensus in favour of accepting those recommendations. Thank you very much. That takes us through to agenda item eight. Um, as far as I'm aware, unless anybody tells me otherwise, we don't have any urgent um, business today. So just to thank everybody for participating, listening and attending the executive today. Thank you.